think it's interesting as a believer, when you start looking at your own culture sometimes, maybe some other cultures, Christian cultures, there's, you have your general American culture, you have all, all kinds of different subcultures, but then you have your, the Christian culture that exists in America. It's interesting to see how some of those things, how things change within that culture. And especially as you compare it maybe to other cultures. We heard just earlier about uh, the Chinese church and the persecution they're going through. Recently I heard about a Chinese church where um, because of the threat of persecution, they have to gather with people coming every 20 or 25 minutes. And so it might take three hours for the church to gather. Then they spend a significant amount of time together. And then it takes about three hours for them all to disperse so that they're not gathering it, you know, so they're not catching attention of the authorities. I remember thinking about that and then thinking about our American Christian culture and how much different that is. There's some interesting trends. It's, uh, it's interesting to, to see just recently, uh, with the last few weeks, there was kind of a, a bit of a discussion on uh, certain social media uh, about the decision one very large and, and a well-known uh, church um, made, very, a church that preaches the gospel. The pastor is someone that I, I have a lot of respect for. But uh, right after Christmas, I think it was, they, they decided to close their services for, a, for an entire, they, they had no services one Sunday. And uh, to kind of give their church family a chance to recover. And so there was a discussion about that. And I, I'm not, we're not, the point isn't to throw stones in any way. But uh, one of the discussions it led to is, you know, is what, what is going on with the way that we maybe see church in America compared to maybe other cultures in other parts of the world? Is there something maybe even slightly defective in what we're seeing in our own view? And uh, it, uh, other pieces of that, I, I know uh, recently, uh, probably about two years ago, I was having a discussion with another um, person who does music for a church in, in the area, a, a church a good, good bit larger than ours that preaches the gospel. And they said uh, something along these lines that it used to be that you know, they have people that are still regular attenders, but it used to be regular attenders were probably generally might miss one, one Sunday a quarter. And now they're finding that the trend is that, that at least in that church, there are, there's a good amount of people who come regularly, but it's like twice a month that they might be in, in their services. As we think about that, really the point I, I, I'm not interested in throwing stones. In fact, I'm not interested in making us feel because maybe we have regular services and we don't do that to feel better about ourselves because that's not the point of the message. But I think the, po the point that I want to make is that I think we have sometimes lost a sense of what we are here for or why do we meet. Many of us know some of the truths, maybe some of the commands or examples we have from, from the New Testament. You may know that the word for church is that of ecclesia. That's like the gathering or assembly, the called out, those that are called out or called together. You may know that that's, so obviously that says something about who we are and what we, what we do. You may know that the example of the early church, that they met from house to house, even, even on an almost daily basis. You may uh, be familiar with the idea that the, this is called the Lord's Day. Sunday's called the Lord's Day. That after Jesus rose, the early church started worshiping re, uh, you know, weekly on, on that day, that first day of the week instead of the Sabbath. You may even be familiar with the, the, the verses in Hebrews where it talks about forsaking not the assembly of uh, the believers. And so you may know, okay, it's, you know, clearly the Bible is giving us instruction to join together and worship regularly, you know, at least on a weekly basis. And yet the truth is, often we don't, I think we're missing the why. These things all, they might be a why in the sense of we want to obey or we want to follow, but they don't really give us a clear picture at least of what the purpose is in the first place of us joining together. 
it is important for us to know why we do things. Okay, first of all, for, you know, when we have commands, really knowing why those commands are given, we don't always know why, do we? God doesn't always tell us why he gives us commands. And we should understand that whatever he commands us is good for us. So that should be a basic understanding. But the reality is, knowing the why can really help us motivate, help motivate us to obey, can it? Do you feel more likely to obey a command in scripture if you know here is what that is for? Here is how this can help. Or here is how, what the benefits of that are. But even beyond that, knowing the why not only can help motivate us to obey, but can help us to better obey. If you know something, God wants us to do something, but you have no idea why, when you do that thing, you may miss the entire point of why you're doing it in the first place, and so not obey as well. We could, for example, if you go to school, some of you, it's been a long time, some of you are still in school right now. When you go to school, if your mindset is, I'm going to school because I have to, the law says I have to, how much are you going to get compared to if you have a mindset of, this is preparation for the rest of my life. One person might do all right, but just as well might not. They're probably not going to be quite as motivated to study and learn as the person who says, I know this is beneficial, here's why. It's going to prepare me. So let's think about church. Is it important for us to know why? And to tonight, or this afternoon, I'd like to share just one reason. This, I, this doesn't fully uh, give that whole, all the why for it, but there is one reason in the passage we're about to look at that I think really does and really can help us to see not just the command or the instruction to be here, but the purpose for that. So I'd like, to, I'd like us to take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 11 through 14. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 14. I've been looking at this passage off and on for a long time. It's one of those that's been challenging to me and uh, I'm excited about looking into it. Let's, let's take a look at this passage. I'm going to read it out loud, follow as we read. Ephesians 4. Verses 11 through 14 it says this, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. Verse 13, Till we all come into the unity of the faith, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue, stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness where they, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look into this passage. Lord, help us to see what you are telling us here. Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to just see it. Lord, but that you would give us a desire to be part of this great plan that you have for us in the church. Lord, m Lord, I pray that you'd help us, uh, even as we see that plan, Lord, that you'd, you'd help us to want to be part of that, to, to desire to make changes in our lives that we can uh, further follow you and obey you better. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. This passage in Ephesians has a word that really we're, we're starting, that's in the first verse and also in the last verse, that I think ties this all together. There's a word... In the end of verse 11, it, it says this, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then at the end of this passage, it says, unto the edifying of itself in love. 
I think as we look at this passage, you'll see that that word really is a common theme throughout the whole passage. And I want to break this down for you. First of all, in verses 11, 12, 11 and 12, you see these gifts that are given, or these people with gifts that are given to the church, and the purpose of those positions or those, those gifts. So first of all, in 11, he talks about uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, some of those gifts have, have passed along, okay? We, we would certainly say that the gift of apostleship has passed with those apostles. There are no new apostles. I would be a little bit wary if someone came in here and said, I am an apostle. Now, maybe, maybe they'll mean something totally different than what we think of but in, in the scriptures. But if you look at the scriptures, there were a certain limited number of apostles, and they have since passed from this world, are in heaven. But we do have uh, people who are evangelists and pastors and teachers. We have those that are in our church. Okay? The idea of an evangelist is someone who shares the gospel. That can be a full-time position or someone who's just really good at sharing the gospel with others. We have pastors. We have teachers. I, I'm tempted to, and I guess I'm going to go ahead and do it. I was tempted to say, do you realize that you know, it says this is what God gives you, that, that we are God's gift to you? Sorry, it's a lame joke. A few of you giggled slightly. All right? That this is not intended to be, this is not intended to be a pride thing. This is basically God gives people certain gifts for the purpose of being a help to the church. Okay? And these, these, these gifts or these positions that are mentioned are all really kind of leading, teaching kind of positions. We have teachers. That is not just those that teach in this pulpit or even those that just teach in some adult Sunday school classes. There are some of you who are teaching children on a weekly basis. You are being used by God to share God's word with others. There are probably less formal ways that are of teaching that are going on. Bible studies that are being led around here. Maybe even smaller uh, studies that, that you've put together informally and you have the opportunity to teach others. And each one of these positions, the, each one of these gifts is given for a purpose. So you see that purpose in verse 12. And it says three things. For the perfecting of the saints. What is that talking about? That's really talking about bringing saints to maturity. Secondly, for the work of the ministry. That's to help people serve Christ better. And then for the edifying of the body of Christ, this word edifying that we mentioned is here and in the end of the passage is the idea of building up, helping to grow. The word edify is not something, probably not a, a word that we use in our, our typical English, but uh, we do have the word that we still use maybe once in a while of an edifice some kind of a building. And that's the root of this term, that we are supposed to be building up, or that these people, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, are given to edify or build up the body of Christ. Now, what kind of building is that? Is it, is it that we try and build this building? Is it that it's for the purpose of just gathering a large group of people together? That's not really what we're talking about. Especially as you look at the categories we're going to see here. This is talking about spiritually building each other up or building the, the body of believers up. So the, gift, the, the purpose for these gifts here in verses 11 and 12 is for these three things. To, to bring Christians to maturity, to help them to serve Christ, and to build up the believers that are in, in the church. Now it's interesting, we have that purpose, and then it talks about results. When that happens, okay, what should follow from that? And instead of being talking about those apostles, it changes the word to we. That means this is what we want to happen, okay, instead of me standing up here in the pulpit preaching. I'm sitting in the pew saying, this is what I want to happen. 
because of that preaching, or I'm sitting in my, my Sunday school class, this is what I want to happen. This is the goal of what we're all participating in in that time. So listen what the, the goal is that, that would happen. Besides these per- three things, there, there's, there's some things that we want to happen. And first of all, in verse 13, is that there is, there really is, are, are a couple other things that happen. First of all, that, that the body of believers comes to a unity of the faith. As truth is preached, as truth is taught, that we come closer and closer to each other because we believe the same thing. Secondly, it says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Boy, do we need that, that we know God better. Thirdly, in verse 13, it says, unto a perfect man, that's the idea of mature, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness fullness of Christ, that we become more and more like Christ as we understand the faith and as we know God better, we we become more and more like Christ. The idea of being Christ-like. Then in 14, it says this, that, that there, there's another uh, benefit or another purpose for this, this teaching time or really a goal of all this, that we henceforth be no more children. Okay? We're talking about maturity on the one side, it's that we really don't want to remain children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men and cunning craftiness where they lie in wait to deceive that will be more mature, we will not be children, and we will have discernment. We will be able to see error instead of being pulled away from it, by it, whenever it's, it's, it's taught. Then thirdly, in verse 15, another purpose of, you know, what, what's going on in, in, the, in these uh, times of teaching and preaching is that we would become this. Now, in, the, in verse 13, we see it says, till we... It's talking about this is the goal for all of us. Verse 14, that we, goal for all of us. By the time we get in 15, I think it's an understood we. So it could be, but we. And going on saying, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the Christ, which is the head, even Christ. That we would, as a result of being taught, be able to talk about the Lord, to, to speak the truth to others in love. That when we see brothers and sisters in Christ maybe needing help in their spiritual walk, we would be able to share that truth with them and do it in a loving way. That beyond that, that in doing that, it may help people to grow up into uh, him, speaking of Christ, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Okay, that as a result of the teaching, we start to grow, and then we can help others to grow. And then lastly, in verse 16, you see, and and there's the unity that already happens, and then in verse 16, you see that even going farther. It's like this, it's like this thing that builds. And so in verse 16, you see this, it says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, so that unity has become something that is solid, okay, that we are together, we fit together well, and are compacted by that which every joint supplieth, okay, that not only do we fit together well, but every single person in the church is helping each other, okay, each joint supplies something, that being compacted by which every joint supplieth according to the effectual word working of the measure of every part, that as each part comes in line, that help is going from person to person to person, making the whole body of believers stronger. Maketh increase or growth of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This last verse, do you see all the, all the words that just kind of point to each other and each part? And how we're all connected. And how each part of this this body of believers is important. It speaks to the body. And elsewhere we have that illustration of, you know, the, the hand saying under the head or the foot, you know, I'm better than you. That's not the point. God has called each and every one of us with whatever gifts we have. And he's given us gifts so that we can be a help to each other, specifically in 
a spiritual realm that we can build each other up. Now, when we start getting a sense of what that means, we are going way beyond that question we just talked about of attendance. What is the purpose of us coming together? It is not just attendance. Now, let's, let's just check this for a minute. Can we do that? You know that passage, or you're familiar with the passage in Hebrews. It's Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Let's look and see if Hebrews 10 agrees with what we just uh, looked at. Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. If you could look there with me. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Listen to the context of that command. Verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Why in Hebrews did the writer, did God inspire this, this verse that we would not forsake the assembling of ourselves together? It wasn't for the sake of having a good attendance in a service. It was found in verse 24 that we would consider one another, that we would think about one another, that would be around each other so that we could provoke one another unto love and good works. I think there's something that's happened in our how would you say, our American church culture that has turned more and more our idea of church as something that happens when we sit in the seats and someone gets up and we are the audience. And that when, when the service is over, it's fine, we just, we just, we're, we're gone and we've done our part. We've been in the service. And I think both of these scriptures are saying very clearly there's something else. In fact, that you have a part to play, a very vital part to play in the gathering of believers together. That instead of coming to attend and go home, you have a purpose when you come to church that is important for the body, for those around you, for each person in our church. So I'd say that the message of this passage, and I just want to draw a couple um, points of application, is the message is not about attendance. That's not the purpose of this message. That's not the purpose of really Hebrews 10, that it's just about being here when the doors are open. Attendance is not the point. Secondly, that regular attendance is not the goal. It only makes it possible for you and others to do what God intends. If you don't re attend regularly, you can't possibly do what is the goal of your being part of a church. That goal, um, uh, you, basically, you, you, if, you, if you are not here regularly, you will cheat yourselves and others of the blessings that God intended in this passage and in Hebrews. You can't possibly build each other up if you're not around each other. Thirdly, I think the point we need to understand is that we are not an audience. You know, isn't it interesting the words we use for different gatherings? So you go to a concert, what are you? You are the audience, right? Or you're the crowd, or you're the, okay? Why is it that churches have traditionally called those who are here a congregation instead of an audience. There's actually something good, there's a good reason for that. The word congregation is much more similar to the word that is actually the word for, the, for church in the Bible, ecclesia, that we congregate, that we gather together. It's a fitting word, okay? It doesn't, 
only mean audience. It means that we are gathered together. When you gather together, you have a part. If you have a family gathering, you don't say you have a family audience. What's the difference? You expect to interact with each other. You expect to talk and find out what's going on in each other's life. We are a family, aren't we? We are a gathering. We are a congregation. And with that, we have a responsibility. A responsibility that is very essential. So what is that? We looked at it a little bit there. But God has a purpose for everyone, according to this passage. Whether you're old or young, whether you're a mature believer or a very new believer, maybe you were saved last week. How about if you're brilliant or you're just average? How about if you are well-to-do or poor or any kind of thing that can separate us, the purpose the purpose remains the same, that God has given us gifts that he intends for you and I and every person around you and the people on the other side of the auditorium from you. But all that doesn't matter. You need to remember it's you. God has given you gifts that he intends you to use for the benefit of others in this congregation. And while you're using those, he intends for all those around you to be using their whatever gifts they are, even if you don't know what they are, to edify and build up each other. If you, if you start looking at the other lists of gifts um, in 1 Corinthians 12, which is talking about charismatic gifts, which, from what I understand, have, have since passed away. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about some of these gifts pass away. But even in then, he says, you're not supposed to use them for yourself, but for the use of edifying building each other's up, each other up. You're not supposed to use them to show yourself to be great. It's supposed to be for the use of edifying others. So God has gifts that he wants all of us uh, to use. He has given us gifts. He's given us background. He's given us experience. He's given us insights as we read God's word. He's given us the opportunity to, to pray for others. He wants us to be part of other people's lives that are around us. You know, it's interesting. Do we believe that everybody in the church can possibly benefit others spiritually? Have you seen how the example sometimes of other believers in their faithfulness to young people can be a challenge to you? I've certainly seen that. On the other hand, I've also seen how very young people, maybe young believers or just young people, often sometimes they can see through things that we have, we're just, we, we've become blind to that just don't make a whole lot of sense. Like, hey, you know, and some of the questions they ask are really, they really, you know, can make you go, oh, wait a second. Yeah, that's kind of foolish. Because we've just sort of accepted things sometimes or maybe gotten into a rut and we've kind of even forgot what we're doing. And, and sometimes they can see through our inconsistencies and maybe even help us see through our own inconsistencies. Can a new believer be an encouragement to an older believer? Uh, or someone who's been a believer for a while? Absolutely. How many of you have seen when someone gets saved and you see that newborn joy of the Lord and you're convicted, you know, what is wrong with me? I've known the Lord a whole lot more. Why am I not so excited? and been challenged anew in your, in, in your walk with the Lord. As I look around this congregation, there are many different people here in this congregation that have challenged me spiritually in different ways. I, I so enjoyed hearing some of those testimonies, uh, I think it was Thanksgiving, and just rejoicing in the way the Lord was, was working in different people's lives. Loved going, going out with uh, Randall and seeing how the Lord is changing him in, in awesome ways. And um, just the things that he shared just, just made me so excited. God can do that to me too. He can still change me and I need it. 
So we need each other. The point is not just coming. The point is being part of each other's lives. You may have, you may have to slide in late to the work. You may have to run early. But make it a point not just to be here, but be a part of each other's lives. Take time to encourage someone else. This word, edify, and this is the last part of the challenge, this word edify really is a challenge for us. God's plan clearly for us is that we edify or build others up no matter what part of life we're in, no matter what our background is, and I think that is a challenge because often we don't even know what we're talking, we, we don't even know what we're supposed to do there. I know there are many ways that I could be doing that better that I have not figured out yet. And I know some of you may be thinking, how can I help somebody else spiritually? And I think really that's something that we need to spend some time asking the Lord. Can you... Can you look for those who might be hurting or discouraged and pray for them? Can you share maybe even just a verse that's meant a lot to you with a few friends? Can you talk to someone who you see and are concerned for? Maybe that they, they are starting to, maybe it seems like, kind of move away from things that are right and good. Can you just be, have a word of encouragement for someone? Maybe you don't, maybe you don't know anything. There. Maybe they're not even discouraged. But can you do this work? And not just do it like once a week or sometime this next week, but make it your regular practice that when you come to church, I want to lift, to build, to help someone else in one small way this week spiritually. It's interesting. You look at this passage again. God says he gave pastors for the purpose of teaching and edifying. But one of the goals of that is that not only would they teach and edify, but you see at the end of the passage that they teach and edify to the point that you, that everyone in the church starts doing that work as well. What a beautiful thing it will be as we see that grow. We need to ask the Lord to use us in the, in the congregation. That's the challenge. It's a big challenge. It's, it's one of those things that it may be some kind of formal ministry that you're involved in, that you can edify others, or it may be very informal. I would say that most people, it's an informal ministry. But will you ask God to help you be someone who builds others up? Let's pray.